Hi, this is Paul. Just a few more days until ticket sales end for the Quest for a Spiritual Home conference. Uh, we posted a warm-up video that came out a few weeks ago. It appeared on my channel, on Jonathan Pajot's channel, and on John Verveke's channel, and I hope you enjoyed it. It really gave me a taste for it. I just finished re-listening to it myself, and also in anticipation of the conference, I picked up the book Catherine mentioned as well, but I also picked up this book that John uh, Verveke mentioned. And I thought maybe as a warm-up, um, I might read the introduction, do a little bit of commentary on it, because right away, I mean, J John Verveke is like a book pusher to me. It's not like, these aren't all the books in my life, trust me. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, maybe I need a 12-step program. I was, I was uh, when I was reading the Kierkegaard biography, um, Kierkegaard had a real problem with his youth buying books. He had a wealthy father, and he just kept going into debt buying books. Uh, Got to be careful with this. So I also picked up a scanner so I could scan a lot of these things, and I can, I can easily mark up PB, PDFs and take them with me instead of always uh, doing Kindle. I get a little frustrated with Kindle sometimes. So let's, let's just take a good look at the introduction for the book. Often if there's not enough, um, not enough time to, to really uh, dig into a book, at least read the introduction because it'll give you a sense of it. And then you can kind of, it's funny because I do audio books quite regularly. For a while I was doing a lot of Kindle just because I have a space issue, but I'm kind of going back to physical books just because they're sort of easier to manage. Let me see if I can set up a different view here too. All right, this looks good. A little bit of OBS work. In 1884, 42-year-old Reverend Father J.M. McHale left Ireland to take up a position in the Brooklyn Parish. Shortly after arriving in New York, he became afflicted with nostalgia and began to waste away. Um, I think that what, nostalgia is a word that uh, gets used in this little corner, usually in a pejorative sense. Nostalgia is almost always used in a pejorative sense, but again, I think... Uh, Clay Rutledge has some interesting things to say about that word. Newspaper accounts reported that McHale proclaimed, I cannot eat, my heart is breaking. In his troubled sleep, he talked of Ireland and his friends there. He often murmured, I am homesick, my dear country. I never set foot on, I will never set foot on your green shores again. Oh, my mother, how I long to see you. He eventually lost consciousness and died. His death was attributed to homesickness or nostalgia, as it was called. It's interesting how that, you know, how that word has continued to develop. Such a diagnosis was not unusual in the 19th century America, nor is the newspaper coverage of McHale's death. Papers sometimes printed in the pathos-filled letters of, of migrants separated from their loved ones sometimes carried news of their sorrowful deaths. Before the 20th century, let's see if I make this a little bigger. Uh, even bigger. There we go. Let's, um, before the 20th century, homesickness was a widely acknowledged and discussed condition. I didn't know anything about this. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, Americans moved frequently, but they were not fully accustomed to leaving home and did not find the process easy or natural. There was a trauma associated with migration, a trauma they did not shy away from expressing. Americans took homesickness seriously, as did their doctors, many of whom maintained the only cure to return sufferers to their only cure was to return sufferers to their homes before the condition turned fatal. More than a century after Reverend McHale's death, the New York Times carried news of another homesick migrant of two New York. In 2004, the writer Catherine Lanfer moved from Minnesota to Manhattan. She found the move painful. First week ended with a sharp bout of homesickness. To cheer her up, she dedicate, she decided to get a manicure. She told Korean women who were doing her hands, I'm pretty homesick, but encountered little sympathy. The manicurist herself, far from home, looked at Lanfer with impatience. Her eyes narrowed. She sucked in some deep breath, and then she barked out an, an, an uppercase admonition, don't be big baby. This was the modern attitude towards homesickness, an attitude predicated on the belief that movement was natural and unproblematic and central and, and uncontested part of American identity. And if you look back at the, the conversation we had, we talked, about, we talked about this a little bit, how there's, there's sort of an obligation to this. There's a status with respect to this. And there very much is one of the things that I noted earlier in the conversation is that all five of us, John Vendonk is a, an immigrant, and his story is, 
His story is a very different. <laughs> John's story with respect to home is a very, very interesting one, John Van Donk's. Today, those who suffer from homesickness are considered immature and maladjusted. This also gets into this issue of mental health. With the proliferation of um, mental illness diagnoses, the myth of mental illness, and how we sort of medicalize mental illness, and, and by medicalizing it in a modern sense, sort of suck it up into the monarchical vision and say, well, there's ill and there's well. There's healthy and there's maladjusted, but all of these things are deeply tied to the normative, and of course the normative is deeply tied to the religious. While this perspective on homesickness is now widespread, it developed open, it developed slowly. Americans have not always been able to leave home with ease. This book explores how they learned to do so. It begins with European colonization and continues up the 21st century, chase, um, tracing changes both in emotional prescriptions and lived experience. It examines how homesickness was transformed from a dire and potentially fatal malady to an inconsequential emotion rarely mentioned. One of the things, again, that I notice as a pastor is what people do and don't mention to whom. As a pastor, people will often tell me things that they won't say to their family or friends in other situations. I mean, often involving, I just had someone recently just tell me, you know, a member of the congregation died and how that day that this member of the congregation died, the experiences that she had and how afterwards she connected that. Now, people can very quickly say, well, that's just kind of a matter of post hoc reasoning, but... I hear a lot of stories that are not quite so easily dismissed. This book explores how love of home, once seen as the mark of a refined and sensitive nature, eventually came to signify backwardsness, prissiness, and a lack of ambition. You can just feel the, you can just feel the, you can just feel the, um, the basically the cultural norms change, the ideals change. It seeks as well to illuminate how Americans dealt with these changing norms and how, in doing so, they gradually learned the habits of modern individualism. During the colonial era, a significant number of those who came to America hoped to return home. Those who could go back did so at a surprisingly high rate. It's very interesting that, for example, a lot of my ancestors never visited the Netherlands. My, Both of my grandparents... Both sides of my grandparents visited the Netherlands once. That's all they got a chance to visit. And they both had cousins and second cousins and distant relatives there that they were still in contact with. I've now visited, and I didn't visit any family in the Netherlands. Those who, do go, those who could go back did so at a surprisingly high rate. For, his instant, for instance, as many as one in six Puritans eventually left New England and returned home to uh, Old England. If you read the book, um, um, 14, 1493, the rate of death in, in the American colonies was just absolutely astounding. Um, I think for some, going back would be just simply survival. Many more colonists would likely um, would like to have done the same, but could not. For a majority came to America in some state of unfreedom. <laughs> well, there's an interesting word. Whether slaves, servants, or wives, hmm, hmm, you just sort of equated wives with slaves there. Um, I, you know, in reading, oh, here we go a little bit more. They had to submit themselves to the patriarchal and communal order that guided social life and subordinate their desires to the will of the larger society. It's funny because sometimes if you listen, for example, to, to Muslims, if you watch that show Rami on, uh, on Hulu, often religious people just sort of drop in like, God be praised, God be praised. Evangelicals have their, have their own, you know, Lord willing to things or something like that. Some of these, some of these, contemporary, some of these contemporary things, well, you, you just always have to mention all of these things. And here they are popping up in the book. They grapple with their longings. Some regarded their circumstances as God's will and, and resigned themselves to sadness. Other took as if resigning it to God will, well, that, that's actually in a way of dealing with the sadness. Um, others took action to resolve their homesickness, but often to no avail since the ocean separated them from their homes. 
By the mid-18th century, a new set of ideals began to alter both the colonial social order and the individual outlooks. Enlightenment philosophy celebrated the freely moving individual who maximized happiness and who could be at home anywhere in the world. This monarchical vision sort of brought up into homelessness. Colonists who could act on the cosmopolitan philosophy, generally white, generally male, began to develop new expectations about their lives. They became less willing to submit to communal imperatives that dictated their isolation, and they manifest new spirit of autonomy as they searched for contentment. I think this actually has a lot to do with liberalism, as she connected in the book. Uh, this recent, um, this recent substack by by Eric Torenberg, uh, first he quotes Paul, quotes Paul's Kingsnorth. As Paul Kingsnorth puts it, rather than seeing humans as hefted creatures rooted in time and place, liberalism offers a new conception. The sovereign human person, disembedded from community, history, and nature, would utilize reason, informed by science and enabled by technology, uh, technology to choose how to live. The rational individual making her choices in the marketplace, overseen by a government committed to liberty and guarding her rights through social contract. This is the basis of a wholly new world. What is crucial to understand here is that what makes, um, and this is what makes liberalism an ideology, is that in order for the liberal world would come into being, it needed to be created. Just as Marxist regimes attempted to destroy the traditional family, the church, and the private land ownership so that communism could materialize, so liberalism did not naturally evolve from previous existing arrangements. It needed to artificially create a sovereign individual from new cloth. So how did this version of human nature get created? Let's segment liberalism in different ways. The first phase of liberalism tried to free people from tyranny. This was the revolution of England and France to free people from kings. The second phase of liberalism tried to free people from tradition. This tried to free people from an all attachment and context, particularly religious and national ones. The locus of one's identity becoming freely cho be uh, became freely chosen belief not family, country, or God. It's deeply religious and Protestant as well, of course. The third phase of liberalism tried to free people from culture. This was the era of mass capitalism promoted by the right and mass democracy promoted by the left. The voter knows what's best. The consumer is always right. The fourth, fa the fourth phase of liberalism is trying to free people from nature. It's trying, this is Mary Harrington's, um, this is Mary Harrington's work, the transhumanism. It's trying to affirm the individual's human right to make oneself anything at all and to deny any constraint resulting from the ancient accident of birth. This is very different from Tom Holland often talks about the demos, which is we sort of took democracy, but um, in, in Athens it was a different thing. You, you sprung out of the ground. You know, we still have this to a, to a degree when we talk about Native Americans, sort of like Athenians, they sort of got birthed out of the, the soil of Athena. They birthed out of the soil of America. Liberalism is based on the protection of autonomy. But with every passing decade, there's been an expansion of the scope of that autonomy, including the realm of human biology. We must consent to everything, including our families, cultures, and bodies. The latter was included transhumanism, which attempts to transcend all brute facts of identity and transcend the human altogether. At no stage do we find a rejection of what came before, only a recognition that it did not go far enough. The history of liberalism is the history of an idea taking itself ever more seriously. Become what you are is the mandate, not only for men, but also for ideas. In the mid-18th century, a new set of ideas began to alter both the colonial social order and individual outlooks. Enlightenment philosophy celebrated the freely moving individual who maximized happiness and could be at home anywhere in the world. Colonists could act on the cosmopolitan philosophy, generally white, generally male, began to develop new expectations about their lives. They became less willing to submit to communal imperatives that dictated their location, and they manifested a new spirit of autonomy as they searched for contentment. Um, for them, independence led to novel opportunities and points unknown. For others, it carried them home. Faced with unprecedented liberty, many individuals came to realize that even freely made decisions to leave home or to stay carried hefty emotional costs. This became more apparent in the 19th century to the 19th century Americans who lived through the market revolution and the emergence of full-fledged capitalist economy. 
Influenced by the ideal of the self-made man, American men and women abandoned the familiar in search of new profits and possibilities. Yet they did so with some hesitation. Although they remembered as a period of great restlessness and individualism, antebellum America was also characterized by a great deal of homesickness. Explorers, pioneers, gold miners, and mill girls all moved forward, but often did so with some reluctance and looked back with regret. To them, their destiny was not manifest. Whether they should go or stay was not a settled question. They discussed publicly the reservations about moving and worried about the implications of their restlessness, since love of home and mother was a mark of good, refined character. While attentive to their own pain at parting, white Americans, often unmoved by the emotional plight of Native Americans, who were forced to vacate ancestral lands. If you read Blood and Thunder, the... The way to destroy the Navajo was basically to move them off their land. And then Kit Carson, who was, um, who, who was tasked by the U.S. government to sort of watch over them, who had, who had had a fair amount of living with Indians, including um, marrying one, uh, suddenly becomes basically heart-stricken by just watching the, the destruction of this people. Nativist attachment to home is seen as atavistic trait standing in the, in the way of progress. Similarly, homesickness that slaves experienced as they were bought and sold generally went unacknowledged by whites, who presumed that primitive blacks uh, lacked their level of emotional sensitivity and capacity. The phenomenon of homesickness, so widespread during the antebellum period, received system, systematic attention during the Civil War. During that time, European conceptions of the condition as a disease became popular, and the diagnostic category of nostalgia came, gained acceptance. The term nostalgia was used to describe the, acute home, the acutely homesick, who many doctors believed might die if their condition went untreated. In fact, during the war, Union doctors diagnosed more than 5,000 soldiers as suffering from nostalgia, 74 of whom succumbed to the condition. Succumbed to the condition. Given such alarming statistics, some army bands were prohibited from playing Home Sweet Home for fear the song might provoke deadly illness in soldiers. After the war, the idea of homesickness might be fatal, con, uh, might, that might be fatal continued to circulate among lay people and physicians alike. Native-born Americans flocked from farms to city, and European and Asian immigrants streamed to the United States. And these immigrants inspired prolific commentary on homesickness and nostalgia. As the nation's racial and ethnic diversity increased, many observers claimed they saw patterns among the homesick populations and suggested that nostalgia was a condition to which particular groups were especially susceptible. For, for instance, psychologists and social commenters influenced by Darwinian theory hypothesized that the groups least able to conquer their homesickness were the least culturally advanced. Of course, that's what social Darwinism said. Those who succumbed to it were unfit for life in modern American society, for they lacked the prize characteristic of adaptation. As the charity worker Morris Fish Fishberg observed in 1906, nostalgia is the first and most effective aid to the natural selection of desirable immigrants. According to this view, those unable to adapt to a new environment and stricken with nostalgia were doomed to fail in life and business, perhaps even to perish. Observers maintain that a variety of different ethnic groups, such as African Americans, Native Americans, and women of all races, were unsuited to movement and independence because of their alleged vulnerability to homesickness. Homesickness gradually became a marker of dependence and inadequacy. If there was a new condemnation for homesickness, there was also a new way to assuage it. For during the late 19th century and early 20th century, revolutions in transportation made migration easier. And of course, uh, one of the things to note is that now we have, via the, the internet, ubiquitous communications. I weekly chat with, with my um, family of origin with video chat, and we message each other pretty much daily. Transcontinental railroads spanned the country and fast steamships linked nations. Leaving, leaving and returning home became much easier for migrants and immigrants, rich and poor alike. Yet the rapid industrialization of the late 19th century that produced these new technologies also led to radical transformations in daily life. Migrants who returned after years away discovered that home was no longer what they imagined it to be. 
Their homes had changed, and so had they. As a result, many Americans began to yearn not just for a lost home, a longing of homesick, but for lost time as well. As they journeyed between old homes and new, many began to wonder if they had any home whatsoever. A sense of homelessness began to emerge that would become endemic to modern life. In the 20th century, the imperative to move became greater. The need to accept dislocations more pressing. From expanding corporations, government agencies, and the military, Americans heard they should subordinate themselves to the large institutions of modern society and move cheerfully when asked. Child-rearing experts suggested that parents prepare their offspring for these inevitable partings by sending them away from home so that they might master their homesickness in early life. One of the interesting things that was common in the Christian Reformed Church was ministers' kids were often known to be subjected to this rootlessness. Um, my growing up was an exception. My father spent 36 years in his first church, so my first 18 years before I went to college were all spent in the same home, all spent in the same place. But my father grew up in one, two, three, four, five different places growing up, and that was pretty standard for children of a Christian Reformed minister. Psychologists, corporate leaders, and government officials hoped that ultimately individuals would learn to transfer their loyalties from mother, home, and hometown to their employers and the government and would be transformed from mama's boys into organizational men. It's very interesting in the 1950s, if you read George Marsden's book, this institution, institutional man theme would sort of go back and forth. Um, people were afraid they were becoming plastic people. There's currently a lot of anxiety. Oh, I think Mary Harrington had a tweet. Well, it might not be her. Basically, not, not only have uh, people moved physically into other locations, but children are not even being raised in a home. They are being raised in institutions. Impatience with those reluctant to leave home grew over, uh, over the course of the 20th century, and the perception that homesickness is a sign of immaturity solidified. Americans learned a code of behavior and emotional management that taught them to repress all signs of homesickness in public life in order to appear modern and, um, modern and mature. Only in the late 20th century and early 21st, as faith and organizational culture declined, did Americans begin to publicly question the relocations that the modern workplace demanded of them. And, of course, with COVID, um, now suddenly a lot of people, at least of certain class, are working from home. Did Americans, um, yet even today, those who resist moving or are reluctant to discuss their misgivings in terms of homesickness or love of home, for this would mark them as lacking ambition and drive. Instead, they express their emotions in other ways. As historian Peter Stearns has noted, in the 20th century, individuals faced increasing pressure to restrain their emotions in public, yet found greater opportunity in leisure time and private life for emotional release. As they type on their Facebook pages or email accounts, watch Bollywood films on satellite television, satellite television, streaming, or visit the taqueria to eat food, redolent of the flavors of home, Americans moved through the culture of memory and connection and tried to recreate what they had left behind. Although it had been repressed in speech and overt action, homesickness made its appearance in daily rituals in ways that often go unnoticed precisely because they are so commonplace. The history of homesickness recovers the story of how Americans learned to manage their feelings, but beyond that, it reveals how Americans learned habits of individualism that supported capitalist activity. Central to modern individualism is the ability to separate oneself from home and family, to wander in pursuit of happiness, to leave communities, if only to rejoin others, to be fluid and unfettered. Church obviously has a big place of this and part of the development of the Christian Reformed Church. So before the Second World War in the Christian Reformed Church, there were basically just little enclaves. This was true not just the Christian Reformed Church, but many other immigrant churches. What happens after the Second World War is now suddenly this, um, this home, this, this migration brought people to cities. And so, for example, People who had settled down in Ripon, California, about an hour south of here, now suddenly are coming to Sacramento for work. And people from different places, different 
places in that uh, where Dutch immigrants have settled now start to move to major cities and major, major population areas. And so there was a sense in the middle of the 20th century that, okay, in the second half of the 20th century, that the Christian Reformed Church basically joins this whole thing. Now the Christian Reformed Church is, is dealing with that. As I mentioned before, part of what happened is, of course, assimilation. One of, one of the things that's a big theme in the Bible, particularly in, in the book of Judges, is the question of local gods. And locality impacts us religiously. Um, and, and I think that is part of this story. And John mentioned in, the, in, in, the, in our little warm-up talk about studies about, well, people going away from home and then sort of secularism. It's sort of that they're, they're absorbed into this machine. That ability has been portrayed by some observers as a trademark American behavior. However, the ability to be mobile is not innate. This book explores the long education Americans went through in order to be able to live like rugged individualists and to make movement appear unproblematic. In doing so, it offers a new history of mobility and individualism, a history that shows ambivalence, hesitation, and reluctance so often experienced by those who moved on it. As their society came to enshrine um, movement as necessary for an expanding capitalist order, Americans learn to live with their mixed feelings and to subordinate the desire to stay behind the goal of getting ahead. A book that this touches on for me is Andrew Root's The Children of Divorce. This was the first book that I had read by, by Andrew Root. And, and he talks quite a bit about what divorce does. The existence of the kin unit was dependent on children. The mergers made in marriage were fleeting if children could not continue the economic advantage and possible societal esteem that marriage union offered. Today we often judge a good parent by his or her ability to raise independently thinking and behaving individuals who can seek self-fulfillment. But in the pre-16th century, buttressed by the Augustinian theology of original sin, parenting was about breaking a child's sinful will, a will that could easily threaten the stability, survival, or reputation of the kin unit. Good parenting was not about forging independence in children, but about securing his or her own commitment and contribution to the kin unit, hence to the home. Therefore, once the child was old enough to work, around six or seven, he or she was thrust into the adult world alongside others in the kin unit. They seemed to be simply no such thing as the idea that children were too innocent or too vulnerable to participate in the adult activities necessary for survival in this period. The dawn of the Enlightenment saw the possibility that the individual, the self, could be thought of and reflected upon outside the, community re the communal reality of a kin unit, village, or tradition. Now that people could read the Bible for themselves and individually were justified, and with the Enlightenment's concern for individual knowing, the self became something to reflect on. I and mine became understood as realities separate from kin, clan, village, or I would add home. And here's some things about marriage from Stephan Stephanie Kuhn's work. Kuhn stated, for the first time in 5,000 years, marriage came to be seen as a private relationship between in two individuals rather than one link in a larger system of political and economic alliances. Making marriage about love freed the individual or the self. As Degler observed, love is the basis for marrying was the purest form of individualism. It subordinated all familial, social, or group considerations to personal preference. No longer did parents choose a child's spouse, although they no doubt continued to influence the decision. Nor were the people um, choosing spouses for their, own, for their ability to work. Rather, marriage was now based solely on the couple's individual feelings of attraction and desire. The question, the question became, do you love him? Not, what does his family offer us? Or, what can he contribute to our home? The older conception of family was a little commonwealth, a microcosm of the larger society had receded and been replaced by a new image of the family as haven in a heartless world, a bastion of morality and tender feelings of refuge for the aggressive, selfish world of commerce. The criteria of marriage transitioned from concrete operations to subjective feelings. Marriage was now something chosen by the individual, not something constructed by kin units and village communities, something constructed by home. Becoming a self became the child's vocation, and the family his or her location to do so. The child was dependent then on, the, on belonging and meaning provided by the tenuous family, 
which when sunk by divorce, left the self of the child without a place or purpose to grow. Divorce in a modernized world then attacks the self because the self is formed within the belonging and meaning provided by the family. When it is destroyed, the family meaning or the home, we used to talk about children coming from broken homes. Um, now, children, more and more children are being produced by no home at all. The threat of lost places and lost purpose became a reality. Without place or purpose, one becomes a lost self. Back to the homesickness book. Being a rugged, mobile individualist involves mastering an emotional code, knowing how and when to express some emotions and repress others. It means acting optimistically, cheerfully, and with little regret while embracing change and novelty. It demands for such traits first emerged in the late 18th century did not become dominant until the 20th. Individuals and families were watchguards of emotional expression and helped to incubate, inculcate such habits and behaviors in each other. But so too did influential success advisors, child rearing experts, and modern psychologists who helped shape emotional norms and work to create models of personality well suited to the need of the capitalist economy. During the 20th century and 21st century, they celebrated their individuals who, who, sep, um, who can separate and move on and have portrayed as and have portrayed as pathological and maladjusted those who could not. Scholars commenting on contemporary attitudes towards homesickness suggest that in modern America, since homesickness is seen as something childish, it's socially sanctioned even among children. So it's very common. You take your child to nursery at church for the first time and the child cries, Mama, don't leave me with these strangers in this room, in this institution. And basically, all of the older women are like, drop the kid off and get out the door. The kid will be all right. And same thing happens at school. You go to kindergarten class and you just see how many are crying. And it's a mark of parenting success if your child walks away happily into the arms of the school district. Oh my, is, Gim is Grim Grizz going to have a field day with this video? Because it has become a taboo emo because it has become a taboo emotion, homesickness is not a category that Americans use to assess their society or their past. The emotion is absent from nationalist narratives in which historical um, actors are largely portrayed as happy movers. Alexis de Tocqueville often re often offered perhaps the most famous sketch of American mobility when he wrote, "An American will build a house in which to." pass his old age and sell it before the roof is on. He will plant a garden and rent it just so that just as the trees are coming into bearing. He will clear a field and leave it others to reap the harvest. Settle in one place and go off elsewhere with his cha um, with his changing desires. Now this of course is getting um, changed. Jonathan or John Verveke noted that um, many are there's there's no way to sort of buy home. And, and offers are, many others are saying, well, what you should really do is rent. So then, well, you're not responsible for anything physical in your domicile, in your domicile, in your domicile. You're not responsible for anything physical in your, in your domicile. You just, well, when it breaks, find a new one or find a new one when it appeals to you. Later commenters like Frederick Jackson Turner elaborated on this vision, portraying unceasing movement as essential to the American identity. Modern historians have continued to use the interpretive mode, describing Americans as uprooted, restless, and a nation on the move. The emphasis on effortless mobility and the silence on the topic of homelessness has been self-perpetuating. Because homesickness is absent from modern accounts of the past, it is seen as an illegitimate emotional emotion in the present. For instance, the mythology of individualist um, individualistic pioneers has been used to motivate successive generations to move on bravely and without hesitation, despite the fact that the pioneers themselves were homesick and hesitant, and that many hoped to, and sometimes did, return home. Telling their stories, the history of homesickness restores emotional complexity to the U.S. history and undercuts. Now she's basically saying, well, this is justification for the book. Let's see how much more we want to go. 
The first historian to critically study homesickness and nostalgia maintained that while individuals longed for home throughout history, the new invention, the invention of new names for the longing changed the meaning and experience of the emotion, transforming private feelings into socially recognized problems and disease. One of the interesting things in this is the public-private thing that happens in secularity. Religion, of course, goes private. Emotions go private. What's left for public? Well, cheerful, happy, beautiful, those get displayed on the screens. Now suddenly you've got tensions between, and this of course is accentuated with social media, everyone on Instagram is cheerful, happy, beautiful, has, has an incredible body, has a lovely six pack, and here am I looking at myself in the mirror thinking, oh, maybe I need a hair transplant. This book builds on the observation beginning in its examination in the colonial period when the words nostalgia and homesickness were first coined and employs the words in accordance with their historical usage. It also takes seriously the fact that homesickness means different things to different people at different times. Some who use the words long for family, some for houses, others for towns and landscapes. So now that we don't have the bachelor and bachelorette, I've been watching Farmer Wants a Wife. And one of the interesting things in that show is that Basically, for a lot of these farmers, the criteria is, well, is she beautiful? Yeah. Um, does she have a good personality? Yeah. Do we get along? Yeah. But she, does she love the farm as much I, as I love the farm? And one of the contestants in it has is a mother of an 11-year-old daughter. High risk looking for another husband on a game show. But, of course, that mother is going to be does he love my daughter? Will he love my daughter? Or if she's not particularly caring about that, where on earth is does is the daughter what on earth is the daughter left with? Maybe I'll end this with the beginning of Andrew Root's book. We excitedly told both of our families they received words of encourage. We excitedly told both of our families, then received words of encouragement with good wishes. Flying back to Los Angeles, passing over the mountains, I would cross with dread months. Um, I would cross with dread months later. I eagerly anticipated my future. He was beginning a home. When the automatic exit doors slid open at LAX terminal and the warm Southern California air hit my body, I felt whole, happy, hopeful. But on a cold, rainy L.A. night, this all changed. I returned home from a late class and found a frantic voicemail from my fiancé. I raced to her apartment where she was curled on her bed, sobbing. Her mother had caught her father, who had been her hero, with inappropriate and illicit material on his computer, including love letters to and from another woman. Just as our own was months away from starting, her parents' marriage was over. The grief consumed our lives. The loss of her parents' marriage seemed to be affecting my fiancé from the inside out. At 23, Kara found herself questioning who she was and where she belonged. There was not simply questions of social location, where will we spend Christmas, what about the house she grew up in? Although those thoughts were painful in their own right, her more distressing questions were existential. They seemed to come from the core of her being. In the middle of many nights, she would call me, awakened from a deep sleep in the state of terror. Kara felt as if the split in her parents' marriage had become a split in her own being. I have to start all over again. I mean, seriously, who am I? She stated repeatedly. It was Memorial Day when her questions became my own. We had returned from Kansas City where Kara's sister had just gotten married. It was the first time that Kara had seen her father since her parents' breakup. Thoughts of seeing him paralyzed her for weeks. It was painful as it was. We had, a, we had survived. As painful as it was, we had survived. I sat down to work on a paper when the phone rang. It was my father. Since it was a holiday, I wasn't surprised to hear from him. He began by asking me how I was and thought we were easing into a routine conversation. With this in mind, I rehearsed recent small events, then returned the, his softball question with one of my own. What's going on there? A lot, actually, he said. 
For the next 20 minutes, my father explained that my mother was having an affair and that she'd had, she'd had had his, and that he, he'd had his own in the years of their marriage. He explained that they didn't know what was next, but they wanted me to be aware. In phone calls over the following day, both my parents assured me that they were going to, that they were going to work through this, that they were going to try to save their marriage. I doubted them from the start. I had never been privy to many specifics, but I had known for many years that their marriage was anything but solid. Now I heard of their infidelity, I, like Kara, felt as if I had been sucked into a dark pit. In a real sense, I started to wonder who I was, to question where my very existence rested on anything, whether my very existence rested on anything solid at all. I couldn't help but feel that their actions attacked me, the core of my person. After all, I was a product, quite literally, of their love and commitment. I came into being out of their union, their mutual desire that created a community called parents to love and to care for me. I existed because of their choice, and now they were choosing to destroy their very communion, on the very communion that had made me. The disunion threatened me nothing less than ontologically. It's very interesting how that word for us continues to sort of be a foundational word. Which is to say, it shook my very being and existence. That was why during the flight to Minneapolis, I wanted anything to interrupt my first encounter with my parents since their confession, even if it was a plane crash. Kara and I were returning to Minneapolis to finalize our wedding plans. We were we were struck by the irony that in the brief six months, six month course of our engagements, both of our parents' marriages of more than 25 years had fallen apart. Kara and I were married a few months later. Her parents divided into separate into her parents divided into different pews. I don't even have the book on. I often tell people. Funerals are, in some sense, easier than weddings. Doing weddings from children's from bro of children from broken homes, just watching the parents, boy, it's something to watch. Her parents divided into different pews, sitting on different sides of the room in at our reception. My parents were arm in arm, pretending that all was okay only to return home to sleep in different rooms. After a while, the tension became too much and separation was inevitable. As it approached, my mother especially tried to discuss it with me. She tried to explain that they had married young and that she had been unhappy for many years. She explained that if, if she was a, were able, she might go back and not have married my father. I could see how painful this had been for her. It was clearly that their separation would be a relief, a liberation for her. But, she ta but as she talked, I could feel that her liberation would mean my oppression. While she discussed the relief and pain of admitting the defeat of her marriage, I could only feel the defeat of the community that was once the source of my very existence. Hearing her quiet, earnest explanation, I could almost feel myself sliding back into non-being. I felt numb, cut loose, unbound. My family had never been perfect, but it had been my family. Now that it was falling apart, it seemed as if I had nowhere to stand. It was like the scene in the movie Back to the Future when Marty begins to become transparent as it looks like he will fail to bring his teenage parents together. It seemed as if I were fading into nothingness. I never forgot reading that. It opens the book. It's powerful. That's it for Homeroom. Uh, leave a comment and... Um... I'll try to read them.